Assalamu alaikum, my dear brothers and sisters, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to welcome you all to our second session on the tafsir of Surah Fatir. Alhamdulillah, we of course begin by thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us the tawfiq and this opportunity to reflect and share some, some ideas about the profound uh, wisdom uh, that is contained uh, in this uh, in this surah. <clears throat> in our last discussion, we we spoke in some detail about the first verse. I'll quickly uh, summarize it, and I'll I'll share with you uh, an excerpt from one of the du'as of Imam Zainul Abidin in Sahih al Sajjadiyah, where he speaks about some of the most prominent angels and their respective duties. So in the first verse, we read, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillahi fatir al-samawati wal-ard, ja'il al-malaikati rusulan uli ajnihatim mathna wa thulatha wa ruba' yazidu fi al-khalqi ma yasha'u inna Allah ala kulli shay'in qadir. Praise be to God the originator of the heavens and the earth, who appoints the angels as messengers of wings two, three, and four, increasing creation as he will. Truly God is powerful over all things. In our previous lesson, <clears throat> we mentioned that, we mentioned the meaning of tahmid, and it is the idea of expressing awe and reverence, not only for what God provides, but for who he is. We praise him because of who he is and what he bestows upon us in the form of blessings. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who originated the heavens and the earth. And we spoke about the verb fatara, which means to split. And we mentioned that you know, one of the most uh, interesting views is that, you know, when you think of this verse in terms of uh, the Big Bang Theory, we know that about 15 to 16 billion years ago, the heavens and the earth and the entire cosmic system with its galaxies and stars were one single mass. So, Fatara, and to describe Allah as Fatr, the one who split is is appropriate and uh, and takes on a new meaning uh, in light of uh, the new information that we have about the big bang theory and as i mentioned some scholars say that it refers to the that it, the, the splitting is really it's it's almost like a metaphor that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala splits the the darkness of non-existence with the light of existence and the verse also speaks about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created a system whereby he delegates the governance of creation to angels, meaning that Allah is in full control, but there are certain parts of his creation. In fact, every part of his creation is, is governed and is regulated by a, by a system of malaika of angels and we said that all angels function as messengers and the, and the message can either be legislative or creative the risale can be taqwini or tashri'i and we spoke about all of this in in depth in our first session and then we have the description of angels having wings 2 3 and 4 and if you remember we mentioned that there's a, there's a difference of opinion among commentators regarding the nature of these wings. The scholars who have more of a literal inclination when they examine Quranic text, they, they read these verses and they say that these verses are literal descriptions of angels, that they actually have wings because ajnah means wings and therefore they ascribe uh, physical wings to angels. Other scholars have said that angels are not physical beings and the, the number of wings are in fact commensurate with the angels 
spiritual station. Therefore, the more wings, the higher the station. And we mentioned also that we have traditions where Ja'far ibn, ibn Abi Talib, the elder brother of Ali ibn Abi Talib, who was martyred in the Battle of Mu'tah, we have narrations from the Prophet that says, because his arms were severed, that Allah will replace his arms with two wings that will allow him to, to fly throughout paradise as he wishes. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that Ja'far ibn, uh, ibn Abi Talib is going to actually physically have wings, but it's a reference to his esteemed status in paradise and the fact that he is able to roam through the paradisal garden and he's not restricted as, as others may be restricted. Now, I wanted to just share some excerpts from the third supplication in Sahif al-Sajjadiyya. Sahif al-Sajjadiyya, as many of you know, is a collection of some of the supplications of Imam Zainul Abidin salam on many different topics, many different subjects. The Imam alayhi salam has supplications where he supplicates for the well-being of his parents, of his children. He has supplications that he used to recite when he would see lightning and thunder. And there are supplications that he would make for those who are protecting the borders of the Islamic State, and so on and so forth. In the third supplication in Sahif al-Sajjadiyya, Imam Zain al-Abidin salam interestingly has an entire dua where he sends salutations upon the angels. And specifically, he invokes God to send blessings upon the bearers of the throne and every angel who is in close proximity to the Almighty. Now, one question that arises here is why does Imam Zainul Abidin send salawat? Why does he send salutations upon the angels? What is the reason for this? Now, I haven't really seen any scholarly discussion on this, but perhaps the Imam السلام, is sending salutations and salam upon these angels from the perspective that it is a virtue to thank God's creation, especially when they deliver a blessing to you. Now, as we know, Allah has created a system where many of the blessings and the bounties that we enjoy come to us through the medium of angels. So when the Imam السلام, sends salawat upon malaika, it's, it essentially goes back to one of his statements where he says, Man shakar al makhluq, shakar al khaliq. That whoever expresses gratitude to the created has expressed gratitude to the creator. So you see that Ahlul Bayt, السلام, they practice gratitude, that they express gratitude to people when they are on the receiving end of any goodness, as well as. Malaika. Now, again, I, I'm not going to share the entire dua. I just wanted to share some, some excerpts uh, where uh, the Imam makes mention of specific classes of angels and he mentions the names of some of the most prominent angels. The Imam السلام, says, Allahumma wa hamalatu arshik. O God. Send your salutations, O oh God, as for the bearers of your throne. And inshallah, maybe in subsequent sessions, we'll speak about the meaning of Arsh. Allahumma wa hamalatu arshik, alladheena yafturoon, alladheena la yafturoon min tasbihik. O God, as for the bearers of your throne. So we know that there are certain angels who are so elevated and who are so pure and who enjoy a nearness to God, whereby they have they are commissioned with the bearing of the divine throne. And the Imam describes them as being they those who never flag in glorifying you. They don't become fatigued. They never tire of worshipping. You know, 
you know, sometimes you and I, we may feel that we're so spiritual and we're, we're so refined and we're so holy because we spent a few hours reciting dua. But whenever we feel inflated with ruj, we should remind ourselves that Allah has an entire, He has an entire class of creation. He has trillions and trillions of malaika who worship Him and glorify Him at every moment and they don't, they don't grow tired. They never tire, they never become wary of calling you. They never tire of worshiping you. They never prefer curtailment over diligence in your command. They enjoy glorifying Allah. It's not that they're compelled and they're doing it begrudgingly. They, they enjoy, there's a sweetness, there's a pleasure that they experience when they express gratitude to Allah, when they supplicate to Him. And they are never heedless of passionate love for you. You know, our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as human beings, it fluctuates. You know, even, even if we don't admit it, you know, some days we feel closer to Allah, especially when Allah showers us with blessings, our, our love for Him perhaps may deepen. If we don't get what we want, if Allah doesn't answer our dua, we're patient. And perhaps our love for Him fluctuates. But malaika, but angels, they have this burning passion for Allah that never subsides. It's a passionate love that drives them, that motivates them to, to sanctify Allah, and to worship Him and to glorify Him. And then, so the Imam spoke about Hamalat al-Arsh. And Allah in the Qur'an, He mentions that these angels, they, one of their duties is that they do istighfar for mu'mineen. وَيَسْتَغْفِرُونَ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا then the Imam alayhi salam continues and he mentions Israfil. Wa Israfil sahibu sur. So if you want, inshallah, you can read the entire dua. It's dua number three, supplication number three in Sahifa Sajjadiyya. Wa Israfil sahibu sur. And Israfil, the owner of the sur, the trumpet. Now, of course, you know, this is figurative language because. Our minds cannot even fathom who Israfil is and what is the mechanism through which he will bring the entire creation to extinction. So, you know, what is this power that has been given to Israfil? What is this? What is the nature of this trumpet that he will use, which will essentially cause the collapse of the entire cosmic system? وَإِسْرَافِيلُ صَاحِبُ الصُّورِ أَشَّاخِصُ الَّذِي يَنْتَظِرُ مِنْكَ الْإِذْنِ Look at how Imam Zainul al -Abidin describes malaika. And when you read these descriptions, brothers and sisters, is there any doubt left in our minds that Ahlul Bayt alayhim was salam had, had He, the angels departing. These are not descriptions of people who are just thinking in theoretical terms. They have a living experience with, with angels. And, and Israfil, the owner of the trumpet, fixed in his gaze, awaiting your permission. And the descent of the command. What command? The command for the destruction of the universe. So there are two, there are two things that, that he does essentially. 
the first blowing of the trumpet, the first blast will annihilate creation as we know it. And the second class, the second blast that he may arouse through the blast, the hostages thrown down in the graves. You know, brothers and sisters, when we are put in our graves, we're hostages, we're helpless. It's as though we are captives of that, that hole in the ground. And it is him, Israfil, who will awaken the people from their graves. And then Imam Zain al-Abidin, he says, وَمِكَائِلُ ذُو الْجَاهِ عندك. And Mikail, or Michael, possessor of standing with you. ذُو الْجَاهِ عندك. He has a very high position with Allah. وَالْمَكَانِ الرَّفِيعِ مِنْ طَاعَتِكَ And he's raised up. He has a very elevated station in your obedience. Now there are some ahadith that, that mention that Mikail is at least one of the angels who is responsible for the distribution of rizq. He's responsible for the distribution of rizq according to some traditions. And then the Imam says, وَجِبْرِيلُ الْأَمِينُ عَلَىٰ وحيك. And Jibra'il entrusted with your revelation. You know, all of the angels are Amin. They're all trusted. But because of the importance of divine guidance, Allah gives this responsibility to His archangel, to the most elite of His angels. That all of them are Amin. But Allah doesn't give this responsibility to anyone. Because guidance is so important, Allah gives it to His choiciest angel. المُطَاعُ فِي أَهْلِ سَمَاوَاتِكَ You know, there, there is a hierarchy in the angelic world. And Jibra'il is not on the bottom of the totem pole. He is obeyed by the inhabitants of your heavens, which means that there are malaika. Only Allah knows how many. There are maybe trillions of angels who, who wait for the command of Jibra'il, who are under the command of Jibra'il, that he, he governs them. He is obeyed by the inhabitants of your heavens. And subhanAllah, brothers and sisters, you see sometimes the the hiqid, the hatred towards Ahlul Bayt. You know, when people read about this, when you tell them Jibra'il is obeyed by all of the inhabitants of the heavens, they have no problem with it. But if you if you put the name of Ali ibn Abi Talib or Fatima to Zahra, all of a sudden, ha astaghfirullah, shirk, what is this ghulu? This shows you that it's, you know, Allah gives his he bestows favor upon whoever he wishes. So it seems that the problem is with these personalities. There are, you know, there's contempt for them. Why is it surprising that Allah has given high stations to human beings? Especially considering that malaika, they prostrated to Adam. Prostrated to Adam. In any case, Jibra'il is obeyed by the inhabitants of your heavens. Al-Makinu ladayk. He's distinguished. Ladaik in your presence, al muqarrabu indak. That you know, muqarrab means that Allah brought him close. There is only so much that that we can do with our own effort. You know, it's like the analogy of, you know, when you want to go visit a king, you can only go so far. Maybe you can get to the secretary, but after that, you have to wait then for the king to come and take you in. And this is. Really, one of the secrets of spirituality. You know, وَالسَّابِقُونَ السَّابِقُونَ أُولَٰئِكَ الْمُقَرَّبُونَ Those who are the foremost, Allah brings them close. Because they came as far as they could on their own. And then Allah says, I will take you the rest of the way. وَالرُّوحُ الَّذِي هُوَ عَلَىٰ مَلَائِكَةِ الْحُجُبِ And the spirit who is over the angels of the veils. Now, this is one of the mysterious statements of this dua. The ruh is a creation of Allah who is above. Now maybe the ruh is also an angel. Maybe it's a separate being entity. Allahu alam. But there is something that is called the ruh, a creation of God who has a command, who has authority over 
the angels of the veils. It seems that in Alam al Malakut, in those higher realms, there are angels that guard the borders of those realms. There are hujub, there are veils. And we don't know really more than that. And the Imam السلام, also sends salutations to the spirit who is of your command. And this is a, an allusion to the Quranic verse where Allah, said, where Allah says, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي They ask you about the ruh, this thing that gives life to human beings. Say that it's from the command of your Lord. And you have been given very little knowledge of it. فَصَلِّ عَلَيْهِمْ Bless them. Send salutations upon them. وَعَلَى الْمَلَائِكَةِ الَّذِينَ مِنْ دُونِهِمْ Bless them and the angels below them. So here the Imam is revealing to us that the angels have ranks. They're not all the same. There is a hierarchy. It's a stratified uh, world. وَعَلَى الْمَلَائِكَةِ الَّذِينَ مِنْ دُونِهِمْ مِنْ سُكَانِ سَمَاوَاتِكَ وَأَهْلِ الْأَمَانِتِ عَلَى رِسَالَتِكَ Bless them and the angels below them. The residents in your heavens, so there are some angels whose residence, whose permanent places are in the heavens, those entrusted with your messengers. So there are angels that dwell throughout uh, the kingdom of God. And then the dua continues after the imam describes some of the unique characteristics of angels, which, which are very similar to the, the Quranic verses that we covered last week, where we said that they don't eat, they don't drink, they don't sleep, they don't tire, they don't copulate, and so on and so forth. He continues mentioning some of the most prominent angels. So the Imam, he's, he's mentioned uh, Israfil, Mikail, Jibrail. And then the Imam says, وَمَلَكِ الْمَوْتِ وَعْوَانِ You know, so, you know mo most of us, we, we, we fear Malak al and we act as though Malak al is this bad guy. That we should have, we should have, we should just be afraid of him. We should love Malakul Maut. We should send salam to Malakul Maut because Malakul Maut is the one. You know, uh, there was a scholar. Every day he would send salam to Malakul Maut. And when people used to ask him why, what is your obsession with Malakul Maut? He says, This is the angel who has been given the responsibility of transferring me from dunya to akhirah. I want to have a relationship with this angel. I want him to be gentle with me. I want him to take care of me because he is the one who will facilitate my transition to Alam al Barzakh, to Alam al Akhirah. Wa Malak al Maut wa Awan. The angel of death, Malak al Maut, has helpers, he has aides. Wa Munkarin wa Nakir, Munkaran Nakir, those who interrogate in the graves. وَرُومَان فَتَّانِ الْقُبُورِ And Ruman, Ruman, we, I, I taught a class on this earlier this year about uh, Islamic eschatology. Ruman, we have a hadith where Ruman is the one who comes before Munkar al-Nakir. And he is the one who activates the spiritual memory of the deceased. That he is the one who helps you recount all of your deeds, all of your thoughts, all of your life experiences. And then, The Imam also sends salutations and blessings on the circlers, those who circulate around the inhabited house. So we have Kaaba, and in some parallel world in the heavens, there is a Kaaba for the inhabitants of the heavens. So this is Al-Bayt Al-Ma'mur And narrations say that it is Is directly above It's in those higher realms And this is where the angels And those who are in that world They, they turn for worship And uh, they, uh, they glorify and sanctify God Malik wal khazana. The Imam also mentions Malik Malik according to traditions Is and even according to the Quran Is the, the warden the keeper of hellfire. Waridwan. Wasadanatil Jinan. Ridwan, of course, is 
the angel who is in charge of paradise. And of course, there are gatekeepers of the gardens. And this is why the Quran mentions that uh, there are certain angels, the, the assistants of Ravlan are the ones who greet the believers as they enter paradise. And th these are the ones who say, Salamun alaykum bima sabartum. You know, peace be upon you for your sabr, for your <clears throat> patience. This was basically a, a quick overview of, uh, of the concept of angels. And if you'd like to, to go into more depth, you can refer to the third supplication of Sahif al sajjadiyya Now we come to the second ayah. ما يفتح الله للناس من رحمة فلا ممسك لها وما يمسك وما يمسك فلا مرسل له من بعد وهو العزيز الحكيم Whatsoever mercy God opens unto mankind none shall withhold and whatsoever he withholds none shall release thereafter and he is the mighty and the wise. In this ayah, we see that the verse begins with Ma yaftahillahu linnasi min rahma. Whatsoever mercy God opens. This is an interesting verb that's used. The verb yaftah. Yaftah means to open. Now, <clears throat> when you when you study the Quran, of course, it's important to, to cross-reference. And this is what <clears throat> Allama Taba Taba'i does, that he tries to understand the Quran through the Quran, first and foremost, that he searches through the Quran for verses that address the same topic or that use some of this, the same key words. So some scholars have said that this ayah may be a reference or an allusion to the treasures of God's mercy. So God opening implies that this is something that was closed and there was a need for a key to open it. And this is why some have said that we can understand this verse in light of Surah 42, ayah number 12. Allah says, لَهُ مَقَالِيدُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ To him belongs the keys of the heavens and the earth. Right, so there are, there, are, there are locks. There are certain things that we can do for Allah to open these locks and we experience the floodgates of his grace and his mercy. لَهُ مَقَالِيدُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ and these key, these are keys of the heavens and the earth. There are, <clears throat> and this could be, Allahu Anam, a reference to uh, spiritual blessings and material blessings. لَهُ مَقَالِيدُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ يَبْسُطُ الرِّزْقَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَقْدِرُ He outspreads and straightens provision for whomsoever he will. Allah expands the blessings and He constricts. And Allah has knowledge over all things. You know, Allah's actions are always based and rooted in knowledge. There's nothing that's that's arbitrary or reckless or meaningless. <clears throat> so this verse, the, the underlying message of this ayah is that none, and this is an important principle, this is an important thing to live by, and this will completely change our outlook on life. We will become less upset and disappointed when we don't get certain things, and we will be, we will be much more grounded when, uh, when, we re when we walk, when we step into divine grace. So this verse provides a general principle. And what is that general principle? That none, can withhold what God wills to bestow. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed to give you something, even if the entire world tries to prevent it, it will reach you. And, con and conversely, if there is something that you want and the entire world aids you in acquiring that thing, 
if Allah decrees that it is not yours, you will never get it. This is something, this is an important teaching. This is an important principle for us to internalize. It's not enough to just say, oh, I know everything's in Allah's hands. If you really believe this, believe me, it changes your entire attitude about life. Now, notice in the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he speaks about what? Opening his mercy before speaking about withholding it. So notice that the opening of God's mercy is mentioned before the withholding of mercy. So if we go back here, مَا يَفْتَحِ اللَّهُ لِلنَّاسِ مِنْ رَحْمَةِ فَلَا مُمْسِكَ لَهَا And then after mentioning the, the opening of God's mercy, the opening of the doors of His rahmah and His mercy and His love, then Allah says, وَمَا يُمْسِكْ فَلَا مُرْسِلَ لَهُ مِنْ بَعْدِ So you see that the opening of divine mercy is mentioned before the closing of the doors of divine mercy. And of course, this is this uh, this speaks to the, the idea of Allah's mercy always superseding His wrath. In fact, as you can see on the screen, this is a very famous uh, Hadith Qudsi, and there are many, you know, uh, variations of this Hadith where Allah says, Hadith Qudsi, "Inna rahmati sabaqat ghawabi." My mercy precedes my wrath. And as we mentioned, I think we mentioned this in our previous sessions, is that if you look at the names of God, there are more names, especially Asma'ul Husna, the beautiful names of God. There are more names that, that relate to mercy and love than names that, that refer to wrath and retribution. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his, his mercy... Uh, I think the fire alarm is going off. Let me just make sure that nothing is burning. That was a false alarm. I think that was outside. So if the house burns down, then this will incur the wrath of my wife, and we can't we can't live with that. So, <clears throat> so going back to the verse, Ma Whatsoever mercy. Now, what is this mercy that Allah is speaking about? The opening of God's mercy. You know, unfortunately, brothers and sisters, many people, when they, when they reflect and they think about God's blessings, we often think of God's mercy in terms of material bounties. You know, you see someone who's healthy, Allah has blessed this person. If someone gets a promotion, mashallah, Allah has blessed you. If someone purchases a home, this is a mercy of Allah. And this is true. No one is denying that this is all from Allah's rahmah. However, it's also important to note that some of the most valuable things that Allah gives you are not material things. You know, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitates the acquisition of knowledge, you know, when you look at the story of Musa in the Quran, especially after he fled Egypt and he helped the daughters of Shu'aib retrieve water from the well. You know, after he did this simple good deed, his entire life changed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, he was essentially, you know, he was a fugitive. He had no shelter, no money. He was alone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in a few, in a short period of time, he goes from that state, from a fugitive who's hungry, who's a stranger, who has, doesn't even have a roof over his head, he gets married, 
Allah gives him a wife. He gets a job working on the on the uh, on the farm of Shuaib. But per, I think I think that the most precious gift in the mind of Musa, the greatest mercy that Allah bestowed upon Musa in this period was the fact that Shuaib was his teacher. The the spiritual ni'mah, the spiritual blessing of having a noble, a godly teacher like Shuaib. I think that this was more valuable to Musa than having a wife and having a job, having an income. So the expression of min rahma, whatsoever mercy, it carries a broad ranging meaning. So we shouldn't automatically associate rahma and blessings with the material blessings. So there's no reason to confine the meaning to material or spiritual mercy. Therefore, we can, we can safely conclude that this is most likely a reference to both the spiritual gifts as well as the material gifts. Now, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if He opens the doors of His mercy, the heart will be at peace. Because there is an, if, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the doors of rahmah, do you think that this heart, the heart of such a person, will be agitated? It will be at ease. It will be at peace. It will be tranquil. Even if you're physically suffering, you know, so if God opens his mercy to you, you will be at peace. Your heart will be tranquil even if you are in a prison. For like Imam al kadhim alayhi salam. You know, sometimes when we think about our imams, you know, someone like Imam Musa ibn Ja'far, some of us, we may think to ourselves that, you know, how... How mazloom the imam was. We feel sorry for the imam. That he, you know, he spent 15 years in those dark dungeons. We feel sorry for him. And of course, we 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 feel we we feel a, pain, a sense of pain that this happened to this great personality. But I think, brothers and sisters, that the joy and the pleasure Imam al kadhim alayhi salam felt in the the pleasure that he was that he experienced when he supplicated to Allah in those intimate moments is greater than the pleasures that you and I experience over a lifetime why because Allah opened the doors of mercy for Imam al-Kafir he opened the doors of mercy for Imam al-Hussein so sometimes we might see someone who is physically suffering but their heart is at peace because the doors of divine mercy have been opened. And then conversely, you might see someone who's materialistically comfortable, like Fir'aun, or like Saddam, like Hitler, all these people. But if Allah withholds his mercy from you, you will be distressed even if you are in a palace. These people are not, they're disturbed. Because even though they might have the material bounties, the door of Allah's rahmah, His special mercy is closed off to them. They are deprived. And then at the end of the verse, we see that two attributes of Allah are mentioned in this context. So the verse is about the idea that if Allah wants to give you, no one can hold it back. And if Allah wants to deprive you of something, if He wants to withhold a mercy, no one can, can give it to you. وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ hakim So the two divine attributes mentioned at the end of the verse are Al-Aziz. So obviously you have to be Aziz. So Allah, it's not, so you know, sometimes people bluff. You know, have you seen people? They make threats or they make promises, but they don't have the ability to deliver. You know, sometimes people over promise and they under deliver. Why? It's very, in most cases, because they don't have the, the resources. They don't have the ability, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is al-Aziz, He's the mighty. He has everything under His control. He is fully capable. So He is, he is able, He has the power to give to whoever He wishes to give to. And He has the power to withhold 
his bounties and his mercy from whomsoever he wishes to withhold it from. But not only is he Aziz, you know, you can be very destructive if you have power and no wisdom. <laughs> Subhanallah. You know, if you're in the if you're in the United States, you know, we have someone in the White House, he has a lot of power, no hikmah, and the entire world is paying the price. Many there are many leaders, many kings, many presidents, many emperors. They have power, but they don't have wisdom and they're destructive. And you might have someone who has wisdom. There might be some old sheikh who's living in this village. He has wisdom, but he has no power. He has no power. So the, the impact is very minimal. But what if there is one who has absolute power and absolute wisdom? Imagine. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's, there's wisdom. When Allah wishes to bestow a bounty and ni'mah on someone, it's because it's, this is out of his wisdom. And this is why being jealous is abhorrent. Because being jealous is you essentially contesting Allah's wisdom. Allah gave to this person and you're not happy about it. Allah gave it to him through his hikmah. You have to submit. You should accept Allah's wisdom. And if Allah withholds, it's also because of his wisdom. So his giving and his withholding is based on his wisdom, because he knows what is in your best interest. He's Hakim. Now, when we speak about, so we spoke about this idea of opening, the opening of God's mercy, which implies that there are certain keys that unlock the, these divine mercies. So there are certain, I'll just share three quick ahadith on uh, the factors that elicit God's mercy. You know, we all enjoy a certain degree of Allah's Rahman. You know, after all, Allah is Ar-Rahman. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahmani is that mercy that extends to all creation. But we don't want to only be exposed to Allah's Rahmani. We want that special mercy. We want more. We want this Rahimiya. So what can we do to open and unlock the, the gates that expose us to Allah's special mercy, that special mercy. The Holy Prophet ﷺ, he says, It's very beautiful because it's very simple. Elicit, attract, expose yourself to Allah's mercy, and of course here Allah's mercy, we're talking about His special mercy, because no one can be fully deprived of Allah's mercy, otherwise you wouldn't exist. Elicit God's special mercy through the performance of the acts of obedience that He has commanded you. Basically the Prophet is saying, if you want to unlock the gates of Allah's special mercy, do your wajibat. You know, many, many people ask, Shaykh, how can I increase my spirituality? Do your wajibat. This is the, this is the starting point. There is no, there's no shortcut. There's no loophole. You, you know, as they say, you can't take an elevator to success. You can't take an elevator. There's no shortcut. You have to take the stairs. You have to do your five daily prayers. You have to do the wajibat. Avoid the muharramat. You have to, you have to go through the spiritual grind. People are lazy. People think that I just want to find that one dua and that's it. Allah, I'll FedEx myself to the highest levels of spirituality. It doesn't work like that. Fulfilling the wajibat. And sometimes we wonder why, why, why am I deprived of, of these spiritual gifts? It's because we don't, we don't fulfill our obligations and we don't uh, refrain from the things that Allah has prohibited. Amir al-Mu'mineen. He says, It's very important to be mindful of Allah, to remember Him. The Imam says, God's remembrance. And remembrance is not just to, to say it without hudur al qalb. You, you have to be present. You have to have the presence of heart to be aware of what you're saying. God's remembrance 
elicits the descent of his mercy. You know, if I tell you that I remembered you today, what does that mean? It means that you came to my mind, there were certain emotions that, that, uh, that were present. If I just say your name and I don't even think about you and there, there are no emotions that are attached to the utterance of your name, that's not dhikr. Dhikr is to mention Allah and have an emotional reaction when you mention Him. بِذِكْرِ الرَّحْمَةِ And then finally, of course there are many ahadith, but just very briefly, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahi alayhi, he says, بِبَذْلِ الرَّحْمَةِ تُسْتَنْزَلُ الرَّحْمَةِ Spreading mercy to others, being a merciful person, being a courteous, compassionate person, it attracts the special mercy of Allah. And you know, you know, I was at the park the other day, and I was there was a woman who was there, and she had two young children, and they were playing. And I was watching the children, and I was watching the way that she was looking at her children. And she had the biggest smile on her face when her two children were playing with each other and when they, when they, when they were playing nicely with each other. Why? Because a mother. There's nothing that pleases a mother more than to see her children get along and treat each other nicely. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cares for us more than a mother cares for her children. And therefore, there is nothing that pleases Allah more than when human beings treat each other with kindness. If you want to, you know, creation is the family of God and Allah loves those who treat his family members the best. al khalq Allah. Creation, they are the dependents of God. They're the family of God. So the best of you are the ones who treat his dependents the best. I think we're going to have to uh, conclude uh, here. I'll, uh, we'll, we'll inshallah, leave the verse number three for, uh, for next week. وَآخِرَ دَعْوَانَا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَصَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَى مُحَمَّدٍ وَآلِهِ الطَّاهِرِينَ اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد عجل فرجهم السلام عليكم شيخ عليكم السلام ورحمة الله Could you please explain the difference between Fatara and Falak, they're both defined as two split. Fatara and Falak. Fatara and Falak. That's a very good question. I would have to, I would honestly have to look it up. You know, they're, they definitely have similar meanings, but what is the, the what is the, uh, the thing that distinguishes the two? Yeah, I, I would have to look it up. I'd have to look, look it up in one of the, uh, the more detailed Arabic dictionaries. So, so remind me, inshallah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll have the answer for you uh, next week. But a very good question. I will do, inshallah. And uh, on the topic of uh, expressing, like, whoever express, expresses gratitude to, to the Creator has expressed, or sorry, uh, whoever expresses gratitude to the created has expressed gratitude to the Creator. Could you uh, elaborate on that a bit more? Because it's very easy to express gratitude to someone while forgetting the blessing actually came from Allah. Would it apply to you in that situation? So yeah, so so when the Imam says man shakar al man shakar al makhluq shakar al khaliq, of course this is in reference to someone who who believes in God, who believes that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is the ultimate source of all goodness and all bounties. And it's the idea is the idea is that you should be grateful to people. You know, if someone does you a favor, if someone helps you, that that you should you should be lavish in your in your gratitude because at the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delivered, He facilitated this blessing for you at the hands of this person. So it's about really sh showing appreciation to this person as an agent as an agent of God. So, but if someone, you know, doesn't, but now, of course, being kind to people is a virtue, you know, you know, doing any act of goodness, you're going to benefit from it. If someone does, rejects God and doesn't believe in the Akhirah, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will compensate them in some way. You know, this is why in the Quran we say, Hal jaza'u ihsani illa is the is the, the compensation for good other than goodness. So this ihsan will be experienced in this life if they reject God, or it may be in the uh in the hereafter if they uh if they believe in uh in the existence of God. But when the Imam says, Man shakar al makhluk shakar al khaliq. It doesn't really apply to someone who who doesn't see the uh, the person or the medium as an agent of God. So if someone's atheist and this person just happens to be very grateful and courteous, this doesn't mean that you know on the day of judgment Allah will consider him to be shakir. Yeah, you were you you had a virtue, but you 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 failed to recognize. The most important benefactor, and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, thank you. And uh, when you're talking about ruh in the dua, is this referring to the same thing as what the Christians refer to as the Holy Spirit? So the word ruh has different usages and it depends on its context. So, you know, ruh al Qudus. Is is typically what what I would say is is a reference. So you know the the Holy Spirit that that fortifies the hearts of the the prophets. This is known as uh, as Ruh al Qudus. You know Isa alayhi salam had this. So so we we have to keep in mind that don't think that whenever you see the word Ruh, it's talking about the same thing. Ruh al Qudus is not the same as the Ruh that is mentioned in Surah Al Qadr. Tanazzal al Malaika wa Ruh fiha. This is a different ruh, the ruh that uh, that you know that essentially blows life and the thing the thing that gives us life. This is another ruh uh, potentially. So there there's a there's a hadith that's mentioned in I believe in Al Kafi. I had a copy of it, but I forgot to bring it with me. Where the Imams speak about uh, the differences between these arwah. You know, Ruh al-Qudus, the Ruh that's mentioned in Surah Al-Qadr, and so on and so forth. So, I'll, uh, inshallah, uh, just remind me and I'll, uh, I'll mention it in, uh, in our next session. Because I'd like to, to quote the, the Ma'asumin verbatim when it comes to these, these delicate issues. Alaykum as salam not a question, but a comment on what you, uh, what you spoke about, uh, a, a scholar who used to pay his respects and salutations to Malakul Maut, uh, the angel of death. There was a very great uh, Urdu scholar, uh, Urdu poet in Pakistan who was shot uh, about uh, three, four, five years back. And his name was Sipta Jafar. Mm. Then every day in his poem, is very beautiful, uh, Shay. In his poem, he says uh, that uh, I'm so ecstatic, I'm so elated, I'm so happy. I go to my grave. Uh, I'm so happy and so excited to go to my grave because uh, when I will be put in my grave, I will meet someone who I'm longing to meet, and that is Imam Ali. Mm. SubhanAllah. And then for that, uh, he will thank uh, Malakul Maud also because he should come fast and take him so that when he enters the grave, uh, he will meet his Mawla. SubhanAllah. And every day, every day that was his dua, uh, Shaykh. MashaAllah. Yes. <laughs> he was shot about four, five years ago. Yes. Sifti Jafar. Allah have mercy on him and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to prepare ourselves for this long journey and you know refine ourselves in a way where we when we see malakul maut it, it will be a beautiful meeting and not something that we dread thank you for the uh, the comment jazakumullah yeah I so it's one more thing that was really interesting was just the point about how when Allah's mercy is just doesn't have to be physical. It's, it's non-material as well. Because when we talk about 
Allah's mercy cannot be uh, withdrawn. We forget about it's easy to forget about the non-material worship of uh, uh, benefits that we're getting. You know, and and this you know this reminds me of of Musa's mother. You know, when when she put can you I mean if you think about what she did, she put her infant in a basket and put the basket in the Red Sea. I mean, talk about, talk about, I mean, how do you have the heart to do that? How can you even bear it? But Allah says, وَرَبَطْنَا عَلَىٰ قَلْبِهَا One of the greatest spiritual blessings that he bestowed upon Musa's mother is that he fortified her heart. You know, sometimes when we go through calamities, we don't realize it. We ask Allah to give us sabr, and we don't realize that the strength that we that we see in ourselves, this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The strength to endure, the resilience. This is all, uh, these are important spiritual blessings that we, we shouldn't overlook. So, I mean, on the day of Ashura, if you look at what Imam Hussein Hussain endured, I don't think it's humanly possible to experience that kind of trauma and remain composed. This is, I mean, this is a great, I mean, this is a prime example of someone who's physically suffering, but Allah has opened up all the doors of his rahmah. I mean, even the enemies of Imam al-Hussein, Hamid ibn Muslim, he says, I have never seen someone whose, whose family has been massacred in front of him, yet he is so courageous and so dignified and has such a luminous face like Imam al-Hussein. This is a, this is a great, this is someone who Allah has opened the floodgates of his mercy. And this is why Imam Hussein, you know, he is, you know, al-masdaq al-a'la for uh, al-nafsul mutma'inna. Because Allah opened, opened all of the doors of his rahmah for this perfect servant known as Imam Hussein. So inshallah, we'll continue our conversation uh, next week, uh, and, uh, and as I was telling Brother Zain, inshallah, I will, uh, I'll send you guys uh, the notes for these uh, lessons, so, so you can have them, and inshallah, you can refer back to them if you need, and you can maybe jot down some, some notes uh, or some thoughts that come to your mind, inshallah. So